You know, in the Bay Area, we, for that matter, the West Coast, we're so used to having things claimed as the big event, right? New movie comes out, big event. Band gets back together, tours in the Bay, big event, right? And many times people can't deliver on the hype that preceded what they promised you. California, it might be the capital of promises made and hearts broken. But how many of you know a big event is not a movie coming out. Big event is not a band getting back together. A big event happened on the third day when Jesus Christ got up out of the tomb. So let's just give Jesus, come on now, an ovation for he is worthy. Yes. Hallelujah, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Why don't you turn to the person next to you? Give them a big high five and handshake. You may be seated. Hey, was the worship team amazing or what, man? Man, they, certain point in that song, Break Every Change, they just went nuclear on us. I don't know if you knew that. They just pushed the red button. They dropped a bomb, you know what I'm saying? It was awesome. Hey, we love you, Vibe. And we just want to welcome the campuses, San Jose, San Francisco, Oakland, Palo Alto, Rome. Come on now. And I uh, just want to welcome you guys here. I just want to say this on behalf of my wife and I, your leaders are amazing. We, we heard about them because there was a young man who just texted me. He's watching online. That was a part of the church here. And he would always talk to me about Adam and Karen just vibe and how amazing. And, and you know what? I'm like Queen Sheba, Queen of Sheba. You know, I came here. It's like the half has not been told. I said this first service and I think it's so, so accurate in that a lot of times when people have what, what I would say, like general level vision, like, like globally, like your leaders have a lot of times when people have that kind of vision, they, they may lack a little bit in the personal connection department but not your leaders. They've got vision up here, but they're authentic and they love people, they're present. You're blessed, come on y'all, y'all can do better than that. You guys are blessed to have them as leaders. Chris and I have fallen in love with them. Man, seriously, you guys are awesome. I, uh, I got my beautiful wife here too. I, I tell people I check her back at night for angel wing remains, because I'm convinced she fell out of heaven in my bed. Hey, come on. And. Uh, <laughs> TMI, TMI. This is my beautiful wife right here, Krista. Krista, I want you to wave everybody. This is Krista right here. Hey, Amen. I was born and raised in Oakland, California. And so I'm always blessed when I can be in the Bay, man. I'm, I'm a little partial. I, I just believe there's no place like the Bay Area. I, uh, I, I was born and raised here, and for a while I lived out of the Bay Area, and uh, the Lord called me back to the land of my birth, and he, he spoke to me. The way he got me back, he says, I'm going to visit the Bay Area, and I'm going to release something that the nations will feel, and, and I believe you're a part of that prophecy. I've got a friend that wrote a forward uh, on our most recent book, and uh, he uh, heads up an international 24-hour of prayer, uh, prayer movement. If I were to mention his name, I'm sure you would know him. But in 1982, he had a, a vision in Cairo, Egypt, and he said the Lord spoke to him and says, I'm going to change the understanding and expression of Christianity in one generation. Let me say that again. God spoke to him and said, I'm going to change the understanding and expression of Christianity in one generation. And man, I'm telling you, Vibe, you are that. God has used you. This isn't just a Bay Area movement, which is evident by Rome. You, you, guys are, uh, you guys aren't just a Bay Area church. You guys are a movement that God is going to release to impact nations and stamp a new brand in terms of the expression, I understand that Christianity. And so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm like massively in love with you. Hey, I, I, uh, my wife and I uh, just yesterday, we were in Arkansas. And Arkansas is important to me because my grandmother who raised me on the west side, west side, let me get my letters right, west side of Oakland, California, two blocks on the West MacArthur BART station. It's where I was raised in an apartment complex. My grandmother raised me. She was from Dumas, Arkansas. And my grandma don't play, okay? Like, I, I, you, you know, some people, you can have a sweet grandma. She's sweet. My grandma's sweet, but my grandma could also go Medea on you if necessary. And uh, I tell people, if you don't know my grandma, grandma was Medea off Diary of a Mad Black Woman. Had she not gotten saved, it would have been Medea goes to prison, okay? That's, that's my grandma. You know how Oprah tells you don't whip your kids? My grandma will whip Oprah for saying that. 
This year will whoop Gail because Gail was with Oprah when Oprah said it. And everybody at the scene of the crime get a butt whooping in my neighborhood, okay? My, my grandmother, she was the feared gangbanger in my neighborhood, okay? But uh, I, uh, I, I love my grandmother dearly for several reasons. One, uh, she loved on me. And man, she taught me, no ma'am, yes sir, but... The most impressive thing about my grandmother uh, was her love. And when I was 17 years of age, she went to a small Pentecostal hole in her storefront church at Lake Merritt. Come on, somebody. I see that other places. They don't know what I'm talking about. I got to tell them it's where the Golden State Warriors have been having their award ceremony, y'all. Hey, hey. My grandma walks forward, a lifetime alcoholic. She, in fact, I don't remember a day growing up apart from the social worker coming to our apartment or us having to go someplace in public where my grandma wouldn't get drunk and pass out. She would feed, cook food. I would eat out of the skillet. Like some of y'all got nice little stainless steel Teflon pan. We had a skillet, y'all, okay? That makes country potatoes next level, okay? We, we was po, we was getting government cheese, y'all, okay? I don't know anybody else. But let me just tell you, it makes the best grilled cheese, cheese sandwiches ever, okay? If y'all don't know, the only problem is you gotta cut that stuff. You know what I'm saying? That stuff is hard. Well, anyway, back, back to my grandmother. See, you guys laugh, you encourage me. It's all coming out, man. So my grandmother goes and walks forward, gives her life to Christ, gets back on the bus, comes back to West Oakland, walks in our apartment, is breaking all her alcohol bottles. I'm coming home from school by the time she did it because she went to a, like a midweek thing, uh, Bible study or something, but it was a service. I see her breaking all alcohol bottles, and I don't understand this. I had been through stuff. My dad and mom were never married. I was kind of outside of wedlock, oops, whatever you want to call it. I didn't even see my dad. He didn't want anything initially to do with us or me until I was five, met my dad. My dad was an awesome guy. I, th I thought is five years of age. He was a chemical engineer, uh, worked in Sil for IBM, Silicon Valley. He worked on the domestication of the laser beam. The dude taught calculus on the side. He was a genius, but we weren't seeing that over where I was living. He's returning from a research and development late night meeting, driving on Stevens Creek Boulevard, going down the way. This was probably way before all the different shops and stuff. He sees the cherry go on on a police cop he, car. He does what anyone else would do. He pulls over to the side of the road. But by that, at the place he was at, it wasn't populated. The police officers didn't know there were witnesses. Uh, and I'll explain that later. But at the end of the night, he ends up dead on arrival at a hospital in San Jose with three rounds emptying in his back. They had sick a dog on him. They sprayed mace in his eyes and a coroner said, had he lived, he would not have seen. And then witnesses surfaced that were the same race as the police officers and share the story I'm sharing with you. Thus, it was ruled in court in San Jose that it was racially motivated. And they demanded that he get out of the car and they said, run in. They use a six letter word for African-American that in my estimation should never be used, not by hip hop artists or anybody. If you understand the baggage in the history of that terminology and that's not how we refer to God's creation so that's just me just put that on me but in the midst of that I go through my high school years in this massive experimentation massive don't know who I am and identity I'm in the bay so y'all get this and my grandma comes back and she says she's saved I'm watching her I'm keeping my eye on her and and initially I was trying to talk my grandma out of breaking all the alcohol bottles like I wanted her free but I just didn't think anyone could do it like that and grandma looked at me and said grandma don't need to take 12 steps grandma needs to take one step to Jesus he set me free I watched her and she walked that freedom out she became the most loving endearing woman ever so she would pass I'd go away to I went to college then she passed while I was in college it kicked me into this place where I wanted to end my life. And I'm not just talking about I had the thought, I had a strategy, I had a plan. I was gonna kill myself. But my grandmother made me promise before I did anything stupid, okay, that would first call in the name of Jesus. She looked at me, she said, grandbaby, you're gonna find out one day you cannot do this thing called life all on your own. Promise me you will call on the name of Jesus. So to honor my grandmother, I'm in my dorm room at the University of Pacific in Stockton, California, computer engineering major. And I got my degree, just like I finished it out. And I said, God, if you're real, I want to experience you. If you let me experience you, I'll give you everything. I, f I pass out. Three o'clock in the morning, God's favorite time to wake you up. I see Jesus like I see you. Now, I'm not exaggerating. I hope you know that. Uh, I would be working for Intel. They interviewed me and offered me a position. That's where I would be working. But I saw Jesus like I see you. Proof of it is that I'm doing what I'm doing. But proof of it is I'm alive. He shows up in my room. He speaks to me and the power of God so impacts my life that it's this thing called encounter. And here's what I say. You look at someone, you go, they're not likely to give their life to Christ. And I say, ball that list up, 
tear it and throw it on the ground because you have not factored in the secret weapon of all visitations. It is the encounter of God. When God shows up and shows off, all the arguments, all the wounds, all the hurt, all the other things people have said around you, in that moment, that, that concentrated, perfect love compels you to surrender all. I, I began to witness everything that moved on my campus. I told the first service, I won in the first, no exaggeration, first month, I'm saying, first 30 days, I led 25 people to Christ on my college campus. It wasn't that I was that great at witnessing, it was that they were that shocked that I was saved. It's like, Sean, you saved? There must be a God, right? That's how I was leading people to the Lord. So awesome. Go to 1 Samuel 17. Start reading verse one. I want to talk to you about this thought of the gateway to your next level. We're in a gateway city. Come on, we're in a gateway valley, so this is important. It says in 1 Samuel 17, 1, it says, Now the Philistine gathered their armies together in battle and were gathered at Sokol. Sokol, which belongs to Judah. So notice this. The enemy invaded their territory. The enemy doesn't just fight you on, you know, neutral ground. The enemy gets up in your space and if you're not going to fight, he's going to keep extending his border and keep taking. You know, we used to sing song like, I took back what, what the devil stole from me. I took back, I went to the enemy's camp, took back what he stole from me. And I looked at most North American Christians and I thought, the, the, the enemy's camp must be the parking lot because that's about as far as you get with victory because the moment you get in your car after church and leave, you don't fight anymore. I'm going to amen myself on that. Preach that thing, Sean. That is a good word right there. Oh, I love that. Okay. All right, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm teasing, all right. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley of Eli, I just jumped to verse two, and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley in between them. It's oftentimes in the valley times that the battles come against you. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. We'll break this down in a moment. He had a bronze helmet on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail, that, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had a bronze armor on his legs, man, <laughs> and a bronze javelin between his shoulder. Now, the staff of the spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron head weighed 600 shekels, and his shield bearer went before him. Let, let's break this down. Here is a guy that's almost 10 feet tall, right? Scholars would estimate he weighs in close to 500 pounds. He has 120 pounds worth of armor on his chest. He has 50 pound helmet, looks like a bucket of brass on his head, right? The guy's spear, the handle on his spear was a bowling ball weight of 16 pounds. He has a javelin, and if that's not enough, he has an armor bearer that goes before him. So what are you saying, Sean? Everything about this guy is screaming, Stay intimidated, run, don't fight, you don't have a chance. If I say jump, you say how high, and you will stay in a pattern of running because if you ever think about fighting me, you're gonna have to deal with this. This is what this guy is broadcasting. It says, then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to him, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come out to me. Now, I just wanna break this down and then we're gonna dive in it. This is called representative battle. Rather than this entire group fight this entire group, he says, you choose one man. And if I win, you guys will be my slaves. If you win, I'll be your slaves. Not all battles are created equal. There are certain hinge point battles that when you win and break through, there's some sort of legacy and some sort of historic release that alters everything. And he says, choose a man. Give me somebody to fight me. And it says, and the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we should fight together. I've spent a lot of time in my life on planes. A lot of time on planes. This last year, I was checking the app at the end of the year. Uh, I, on, with one airline, I flew 200,000 miles. I'm sure there are people that have flown more, but that's a lot of flying. And I've become a bit of an expert on flying. I've learned at least this, right? Here's what I learned. Flight upgrades are my love language. Yours may be words of affirmation, physical touch, service. Mine is, Mr. Smith, please come to the front desk. We have an upgrade for you. Like, I feel so loved right now. You know, this is what I'm talking about. Why? Because there's a day and night difference between first class and Cleveland. I'm excuse me, first class and coach, right? There's a... 
There's a world of difference between the two. And they let you know right up front. Those of you who are in concierge in first class, you can board the flight at any time at your leisure, which it is code for. And if y'all in coach, y'all sit down, shut up. We don't want to see you till we call you, okay? And if I don't get my upgrade, I'm walking on the flight. Everybody in first class, they got these big, huge seats, right? They got their iPads and their app on their computers. They're not even making eye contact with you like you knave. You go back, you know, to the hood, you know. So you're walking back. And man, you go out of first class, first class, somebody actually told me, it's true, someone told me that they actually have extra filters and, and so the air is cleaner in first class. So you sitting back in coach with your SARS mask on thinking you protected. I just want you to know, you, they're recycling dead whoever. You, you think that SARS mask is gonna help you? Let me tell you what, that monkey sitting next to you posing as a service animal has Ebola on his banana, he's got E. coli, and he's looking at you like you on eHarmony, okay? So that SARS mask is not gonna help you in row 213, okay? I remember one time, true story, <laughs> I was trying to go use first class bathroom because I held it so long and they had a big old lineup and man, the stewardess met me and closed the curtain on me and says, no, no, no. This bathroom right here, this is for first class. Your bathroom is back at Newark International Terminal C. That's where you got to eat. They're eating, they're eating filet mignon. By the time they get to you, man, you're getting cold fish casserole, right? At whole food prices. You got to pay for that, right? Y'all are awesome. I one time was flying to the East Coast and I had a little layover in DFW. And as I was in this layover, I was so tired. I'd been on a pace, been speaking and traveling. So I actually fell asleep in the terminal. My gate is here and I had to be about a gate and a half away because there were so many people on this flight going to, uh, I think it was Dulles. And so I fell asleep and I just thank God for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. This is a selling point for having intimacy with the Holy Spirit because he woke me up. You ever heard the Holy Spirit wake you up? Come on, I mean, the North American church, we need a Holy Ghost wake up, just for the record, okay? And I believe, I believe some folks in here just woke, okay? So anyway, I'm asleep, and I just startled. I jumped up, and I go, oh, my God. And so I run over to the gate, and what I didn't know is they called group boarding one, two, three, four, five, six. They said, last call. They even called me by my name. I missed it. And the lady tells me this, and so I just get there in time. I get on the boat. Boat. <laughs> I, I'm not even going to make a joke on that. All right, so... I get on the plane. I get aboard the plane, right? <laughs> I initially came here on the boat, y'all. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so I get on board, and the first thing I think right there as I'm on this uh, flight is this thought. Is, is it possible to be so tired from your last leg that you fail to hear them call your name for your next destination? I feel that there are people that are so fatigued from battle weariness and lack of inspiration from 2018 that you're not hearing God call your name The 2019 on this leg. You're going to get to your destiny. He's got something for you. Now, how important is understanding the gate to your next level? Let me say this. Goliath is a gate. Goliath didn't stand in the way of David's destiny. Goliath was David's destiny. You don't become the giant killer without taking out giants, right? You can put that as your little code name on Instagram, but if you ain't knocked out no giants, it's just kind of wishful thinking about yourself, right? So here's what I want to say to you. There are often demonic obstacles that stand at the gate to your next level. And in order for you to go to your next level, it's going to take a fight. It's not going to fall in your lap. It's funny, whenever I ask God for a breakthrough, God, give me a breakthrough. I need a breakthrough. You know how the Lord works with me. Maybe different with you. Whenever I ask the Lord for a breakthrough, he gives me a challenge. And as I tackle that challenge, I get my breakthrough. Almost as if the Lord says, I don't want to reward passivity because you can't be all that I've called you to be if you just sit back and Netflix binge. There's got to be more that you'll stand for and fight than a video game level seven. Come on, somebody. I'm not talking about class of, class of clans. I'm talking about the class over your life, your destiny, your influence. So what God is bringing you into in coming without a fight, your next level won't be accessed, access without taking out some giants. You know the rest of this story, right? David, 
man goes to a riverbed, he gets five smooth stones. They're obviously not big, huge boulders because he's got a little slingshot and he's got to be able to pick that up and sling it, right? And so I often thought, uh, a, a giant that is that armed, what is the likelihood in the natural that a little stone from a riverbed would knock him out? Think about it. There had to have been something, there had to have been like some God afterburners on that rock to take out that giant with all of that. So here's what I say. The secret to your next level is taking out Goliath, and the secret to taking out your Goliath is not found in a riverbed. I submit to you, it's found in four conversations leading up to it. Let's break it down. Conversation number one. David walks up on the nation of Israel. Here's an army. Now, they have had a problem because for 40 days, we often read this story and think Goliath showed up one day, said, hey, I'm gonna feed you to the birds, get a man who'll fight me, and everybody went, aye, 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 and they ran away. That's not what happened. He shows up 40 days straight, twice a day. Twice a day, they get up. Twice a day, they put on their battle clothes. Twice a day, they get in battle formation. Twice a day, they march out and get battle hype. They get in lined up for battle, and then the Goliath shouts, and they turn and run. And then they go back to do that again that afternoon, and for the next 39 days. They're in a pattern, a cycle of rising up, and when they rise up, they receive a level of resistance, and in the midst of resistance, they retreat. Now, let me say something. There's nothing wrong in being overwhelmed, but if you sit under prolonged intimidation, it erodes your resolve to fight to begin with. What good is a New Year's resolution if you don't have no resolve? I'm at 24-hour fitness. It's all crowded January the 3rd, but man, by May 3rd, or excuse me, by March 3rd, I can get on my machine again, okay? It's proving something that if... The enemy can get you in a pattern where you're not facing issues in your life because it comes across as intimidating to run from your resistance. Let me submit something. A believer that runs from challenges and resistance is like a bodybuilder that runs from weights. No definition. You run from that. You'll never build up your faith muscles. You'll never build up literally the, 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 the anti-resistance anointing that comes. You get an anointing to kill giants because you took on some giants. Here is David, man, and here's his first convo. The nation of Israel says, have you seen how big this giant is? Can you see his first conversation begins with sizing up the problem. You see how big the problem is. There's certain people, all they do is talk about how big their problems are. Then they fellowship over how many problems. Then they get a Facebook page on all the problems they got. Then they get on talk shows on, on you know, whoever it is, and the camera runs in the back with you as you're on Maury Povich, and you tell them how big, they get 10 experts to tell you why your problem is genetic and all that kind of stuff. And what I submit to you is David, had he get, got given into that, he'd have never took out his Goliath. David comes on the scene and says, what's going to be given to the guy that takes Goliath out? Goliath, you better go lieth down because I'm going to hit you upside your head, boy. You know, this is David. And what, is it, what it's telling me is that we serve a God that can put something on you where you're not looking to the battle, you're looking through the battle. <laughs> David's already saying, what's going to be given to the dude to defeat him? They're talking about how big the giant is. All they could look to is the battle. But David could look through the battle. We serve a God that didn't just bring you to the valley of the shadow of death. He wants to bring you through the valley of the shadow of death. Right? So key number one, my first key. My first key is you have to have a vision of victory amidst a forecast of failure. When they're talking about how big the problem is, what are they saying? Decode that, Sean. What they're saying is you don't have a chance. You're about to get beat down. How many times do we have voices around us, even broadcasted voices of forecast of, de of failure, forecast of defeat? You have to have a vision of victory. And if you can maintain, Vibe, a vision of victory amidst a forecast of failure, giants are going to fall. You're going to come into your next level. <laughs> Key number one. Second conversation is David's oldest brother, Eliab. Isn't that funny how sometimes the closest people to you, sometimes maybe even family, right? are the people that you would think would have your back, but instead they're trying to criticize you and keep you back. And that funny, Eliab starts telling David, I, I know why you came, you came here to see the battle. And I, I told first service, if he was from Oakland, David, that is, David would have said, no, nah, bro, I didn't come here to see the battle, I came here to beat the battle because y'all ain't fighting, okay? This is, but he wasn't from Oakland, he's from the Middle East, he didn't say that, he was respectful. 
But think about it. What level of fight deprivation do you have to be in to label that a fight and all you're doing is retreating? People talking about battling. No, you're not battling. You're not even trying to fight. You lay down. Whenever this thing comes to intimidate, you give in, right? This isn't a fight. This isn't fighting Jesus style, right? You fight Jesus. What is it? He said, fight the good fight. What's a good fight? I don't talk about the one I got my lip busted and my nose, right? The fight I'm talking about is the one I won. That's a good fight, right? Just wave at a brother. Let me know. Come on. I need a little. All right. So Eliab says to him, I know why you came here. You came here to see the battle. He says, your heart is so full of pride. Isn't that funny how people, haters, trollers, detractors, people that clap back. You know what it often is? They see you fighting a battle. They refuse to fight. And so they start hating on you and become critical of you and talking about how ah, them people think whatever else. You know what the truth is? You are just tell it on yourself. You're mad at yourself, but you won't even admit it. So you're going to project that on them because they're doing what you won't do. Hashtag mic drop. So he said, David, you should be back in the field watching sheep. Now, time out. Commercial break. Fade to black. Here we go. Meanwhile, right before David comes out, David's dad, who's also Eliab's dad, comes to David and says, David, here's some Panera bread. Here's some cheese Whiz. Come on. I got to bring it. Oakland had to bring it suburbia, suburbia, right? I want you to take it to your brothers and feed the army. So watch this. He's on a new assignment. The same father that put him in charge of the sheep is now putting him in charge of bringing food and supplies. So he goes there. His brother accuses him and judges him and says, you should be back watching sheep. How many times do people judge you and don't even know your assignment? They try to put you back. Like when you was at home, Eliab, before you started retreating in battle, you saw me doing that. People try to put you back the way they knew you five years ago, 10 years ago, three months ago. And it's like, they won't let you change. They won't let you metamorphose. And come on, somebody, right? Shake your hair like the old Wonder Woman and come out and just... Bam, you know. <laughs> Key number two. By the way, this conversation with Eliab was the shortest conversation David has because he understands his second key. You got to be selective as to who speaks into your process when you go into battle. Some of y'all sit up and listen to Eliab's all day and then wonder why you can't fight when the Goliaths show up on your battlefield. You need to turn Eliab off, man. Come on, you got to, let me say it again, key number two, you got to be selective as to who speaks into your process when you're going into battle. I need some words of faith. I need some words of vision. I need someone to speak the word to me. Come on, somebody. Because if you don't speak the word, you're going to be all in your feelings, Drake. Come on, somebody, when you need to be all up in the scripture, because truth ain't found in your feelings, it's found in scripture, the word of God. Smile with a brother. I, that was a little tiny spank. Was that all right? Is that okay? Just to be, all right. Number three, the third conversation was with Saul, King Saul. The Bible says Saul was head and shoulders taller than anyone else. So I kind of read and tried to do some research on They say they, they estimate the average man's height during David's day was between five to five and a half feet tall. So they're between five feet to five foot six. So they estimate that Saul is probably six, six two. So this dude is taller than everybody else. So let me submit something to you. If anybody should have been taken on Goliath, it should have been Saul. Saul is Shaq, right? But Goliath is Bumblebee. Okay, so it's still a, <laughs> Transformers. It's still a little bit of height disparity. But hey, you're still the biggest amongst us. But he ain't fighting. He's trying to put his armor on somebody else. But he begins by saying to David, have you seen how big the giant is? Hey, you know what? He's been fighting this long. He's been killing folks since he's a youth. You're but a youth yourself. Second converse, third conversation, we're almost done, is now Saul is calling into question his qualifications. He's saying, have you ever had somebody tell you you're not qualified for something? I believe in this next season, God's going to take you to places your resume doesn't qualify you for. Because you know what qualifies you? It isn't your resume, it's your yes to Jesus. You get a yes in your heart. You get a big yes. You get a big release. You get a big promotion when you get a yes in your spirit. Saul tries to put his armor on David because he thinks it's an armor on armor fight. But David loses if he fights on that level. You lose that. You don't fight the devil on the devil's terms. Our battle's not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, principalities, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. That the weapons of warfare are not 
carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling out of strongholds. He's trying to clothe David in his unbelief. And David said, man, I can't walk in this, man. He said, I killed a lion. I killed a bear. Goliath will be as one of these third key and we'll have like minutes and we'll have our final point here. You ready for this? This is so key. I'm not going to let the size of the battle determine my strategy. Let me explain. If I kill the lion and the bear worshiping God, meditating on the Lord, writing songs out in the wilderness, if I defeated the lion and the bear by faith in my God, then I'm not going to change my strategy just because now it's not lion size or bear size, but Goliath size. I'm still going to do it. If you got here praying, fasting, being in fellowship, in small groups, connected, let me tell you what, just because now the battle has turned to a physical battle, an emotional battle, some sort of occupational thing going on at work, you don't change your battle strategy. We're not going to operate in the flesh. I'm not going to hate on you because you hate on me. I'm going to honor. I'm going to love. I'm going to act in the opposite spirit. If this is what got me here, I'm not going to change. I'm not going to go Saul's arm now, I'm not going to let the size of the battle determine my fight strategy. The battle is still the Lord's. Come on, somebody. And David understood it. Fourth and final convo is with Goliath himself. And Goliath said, basically, you come at me with sticks and stones and all this kind of stuff. So now Goliath is calling into question his weaponry. An enemy always wants to tell you, you're not equipped for what you're going through. You're not prepared for this. Oh man, you cannot handle this. And I love what David did. He didn't say, well, no, this is a big rock and this is a big, no. He said, I don't come at you in this stuff. I come at you in the name of the Lord. Mm. He's saying, God can bring me through. Come on. He brought Israel. Come on, the nation of Israel out of Egypt. He brought Moses through the Red Sea. Come on. He brought, come on, Joshua through the walls. He brought Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of the fire. Come on, somebody. He got Gilligan off the island. No, 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 I'm kidding. I'm kidding, y'all. Y'all ain't seen coming to America. Never mind. He got Paul out of prison. He got, man, Peter out of storm. He can get you out of whatever it is you're facing as well. All right, final key. David is running at Goliath. Goliath's never had anyone run at him. This dude needs inner healing. He needs psychotherapy. He needs two souls holes, man, because he's jacked up. He never, he's used to people running away, not running to. And the fourth key was so subtle, but I caught this thing, and I love it. And I want you to get ready. I just want you to, this is an old school artist, but she's about to be on the gram. I just want you to touch, hit somebody, get your inner Diana Ross on, and say, I'm coming out. Come on, just tell somebody, say, I'm coming out. Come on, just tell them, I'm coming out. Because David starts running, but somewhere in this process, here's what he refers to Goliath as. You uncircumcised Philistine. Uncircumcised, not just an Old Testament cuss word, right? What is he saying? Key number four. He's saying to the giant, you don't have covenant rights like I do. The people of God were circumcised as a symbol of their covenant, that they were part of God's family on earth, that God passed all the rights of blessing and favor and protection to people that were in relationship. And he's saying this problem is out of relationship. It's out of promise. It's out of favor. It's out of time because David, you got to run at this thing. And I'm going to, and David, uh, Goliath name means multiple things. One of it means a revolution. David comes back of the revolution. In this next season, God is going to bring things full circle for you. And I want you right now just to bow your heads. This is awesome. Jesus, Lord, we thank you, Father. And as your heads are bowed, one last thing. People say that David killed Goliath with a stone. No, he didn't. He stopped him with a stone. He killed him with a sword, but he didn't get a sword till he got in the battle. If you run from the battle, you run from your sword. Lord wants to give you a sword right now.